Addiction Documentary by Inga Ambrosia, author of God's Pharmacy book series. This is a documentary about addiction. It's a multi-part series that will cover all of these other types of addiction. They are categorized by constructive and destructive addictions. We will cover destructive addictions like alcohol, drugs, shopping addiction, gambling, sex addiction, pornography, food addiction, gaming, social media addiction, addiction to violence, sugar addiction, addiction to validation, addiction to conflict, money, partying, going to doctors, gossiping, TV shows, dramas, addiction to new things, politics, sports, and exercise. We will also cover constructive addictions. Exercise is in both categories. Meditation, religion, self-improvement, food, but healthy food, gardening, charity work, volunteering, playing puzzles, peacemaking, healing, encouragement, information, God, and fruit. Anything can become an addiction and even constructive addictions can turn destructive if overused and if it interferes with daily life. Destructive addiction is the spiritual sickness that prevents a person from being able to stop doing something that is causing themselves harm or another person harm. It is demonic possession. If you're familiar with your Bible, Paul was writing a letter to the Christian church, warning them about the evil that was coming against them. In Ephesians 6:12, in the King James Version, it reads, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Addiction is a spiritual attack against the human spirit. Every addiction is associated with a demonic entity. It's important for Satan to get a hold of people and imprison them with addiction so they can't hear God. So they turn away from God and he can eventually kill them. It's guest time. See if you can answer this question. How many people have alcohol abuse disorder in the United States? Is it A, 1 in 12? B, 1 in 120, or C, 1 in 1200. The answer is A, 1 in 12. That number is increased when you enter a bar, club, or sporting event. Places that serve alcohol attract alcoholics. In Jeremiah 29, 12 through 13, it reads, Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. People with alcohol abuse disorder need to call on God. He is the only one that can break the curse of the enemy. It's best not to drink alcohol at all. There's a reason why they call it spirits. It's because it opens the drinker up to demonic possession. Most demonic ceremonies include alcohol because they're calling down evil spirits so they can possess them. I know the last question was hard to imagine. Here is the same question. How many people have alcohol abuse disorder in the United States in millions? Is it A, 1.76 million, B, 17.6 million, or C, 176 million. Keep in mind there are 196 million adults 21 or older in the United States. The answer is 17.6 million people with alcohol abuse disorder. That number is still pretty high. There's a reason it's so high. These people have been tricked into becoming addicted to alcohol. They started young thinking they were cool and then it got a hold of them and won't let go. Society is built around alcohol. It's in media, in commercials, in magazines, in movies, 
on college campuses and in our homes. Some people can't end their day without a beer or a glass of wine. It's become symbolic with relaxation. What they don't know is the reason they feel relaxed is because they're being taken over by a malevolent force and they just check out. Friends get friends to drink. Every first date has alcohol, celebrations have alcohol. Some people find it difficult to stay sober when everyone else is having a good time. It's a trick by the enemy. People wanna fit in. Men make plans by mentioning how much beer they will have on hand. They don't have any idea they're putting shackles on their friends and themselves, that their children will watch them become prisoners to alcohol. They might also become alcoholics by watching them. Their sperm is drenched in alcohol, and when they impregnate someone, they don't know that. I want you to notice this picture. It shows a father holding an empty bottle, and his son is peeking over the top of the counter. What is he going to do when he gets older? Probably exactly what he saw his father do, especially boys. They take their cues from the same-sex parent because it's a model for them. The little boy doesn't even know he was addicted to alcohol as a baby. You wonder why these babies cry all the time? In 1 Kings 15.3, it reads, and he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. That little boy is gonna pay for what his father did, his grandfather and his great-grandfather. They encoded his DNA for alcoholism. His mother knew that his father was an alcoholic and she laid down with him anyway. Maybe she is an alcoholic. Either way, he was burdened with this dopamine deficiency before he got a chance to live. You think his father cares? He doesn't. Addiction of all kinds appears to be different, but they come from the same source. Different vice, different demon, same source. The devil wants you to think it's different, so you pick one over the other picking the lesser of two evils. For instance, shopping addiction is no different from alcohol addiction. Both people are deficient in dopamine. One spends too much time at the mall, the other spends too much time at the bar. Both are looking for a high. These are the places that foster alcohol addiction. You will find an alcoholic at all of these gatherings. You'll also find lingering spirits waiting to inhabit all who partake. Bars, restaurants, nightclubs, concerts, college, casinos, job parties, sporting events. These are people that foster alcohol addiction. Just by association, drinking will occur. Friends, family, sorority sisters, frat brothers, teammates, co-workers, love partners, and celebrities. In college, the Greek scene is built on mixers and kegers. It's designed to get people to loosen up. Early on, teenagers learn that alcohol means good time. They don't think that the addictions they pick up in college will carry over into their married life. They don't think that it will cost them their job one day. They don't realize it will give them depression and anxiety. They just want to have a good time. When dating, people like to go out with other people that have the same vices as them. If not, they will feel judged and feel forced to change. Nobody wants to hang out with a party poop. Celebrities are always showing themselves drinking and partying, and young people want to be like them so they drink the same things, wear the same clothes. They are imprisoning people with the same things they're imprisoned by. They are just as clueless. Then, when they get older, they try to clean it up, but they find it hard to kick their habits. Even family members can keep each other in a cage of alcoholism. How many times do you see someone offer their family member a beer before they get in the door good? It's like they want the person on a low vib vibration just like them, quickly so they don't feel judged. How many parents bond with their children over alcohol, sometimes before they are legally allowed to drink because they want to be friends with them. The 
bar and nightclub industry makes 27 billion dollars off of the sale of alcohol yearly some of these nightclubs make two hundred thousand dollars in a weekend this is from alcohol and door sales they aren't selling any food t-shirts or jewelry this is from alcohol and the entry fee to consume alcohol there are 590,000 purveyors of alcohol in the United States these are people that serve to alcoholics I'm not gonna act like I never was a bartender I was I served plenty an alcoholic and I paid the price I knew people were getting drunk instead of going home to their families I knew I was taking money out of their children's mouths by pouring them another glass of wine they told me their whole life story I was drunk when I served them it's not a good environment there's a lot of sadness in those bars there is extreme sadness in nightclubs that's why they have the lights down and the music loud to drown out the sadness to block the negative thoughts they're trading in their Monday through Thursday demons for Friday through Sunday demons there are 405,000 nightclub employees in the United States these are the security guards managers bottle girls VIP attendants servers and bathroom attendants they are there to keep you under control while you empty your wallet here's another question how many beer barrels are sold in the United States a year in millions? Is it A, 2 million, B, 20 million, or C, 200 million? The answer is 200 million. Somebody is drinking all of this. Why do we need that much beer in the United States? because there is unhealed depression and anxiety and people are self-medicating because they don't know how else to cope. Alcohol addiction is the result of avoiding pain. When a person drinks, they forget about their past for a time. People that drink obsessively are trying to stop thinking, period. Alcohol leads to death. Most accidents involving alcohol occur between the people aged 15 to 24 years old. These are young people. First of all, they can't drive anyway. They aren't careful even when they're sober. They have no sense of danger and they don't balance risk versus reward. They say the male brain doesn't fully develop until age 25 years old. Most of these accidents are by young men. They drag race because of their ego, they drink more than girls usually because of higher tolerance, and they speed more. They drive cars that go faster, they have a death wish when they're drunk. That's also why they get into more drunk fights. The young male brain on alcohol is a dangerous combination. I personally know two people that have died from drunk driving of their own doing. I know of more people that died as a result of someone else driving drunk. I even know of people that were passengers of a drunk driver. People need to be very careful about who they party with and ride with. That car could become a casket. In the drunken state, these drivers don't care about their safety or the precious cargo they are carrying. They just aren't concerned with it. I think that's why Uber has become so popular for people that drink. They've seen enough cars crush like sardines and they don't want the jaws of life to cry them out. Some people don't make it. There are 88,000 alcohol related deaths per year. 10,874 drunk driving deaths per year. 4,700 DUI teen deaths per year. The teen number doesn't seem that high, but it is. You have to remember, that is 4,700 families that were ruined. This is what thousands of graves look like. Each of these graves represents dozens of family members that were negatively affected by a young life snuffed out. 
For a mother, her life will never be the same. For a father, he has no legacy and will never forget what he lost. These young people are being poisoned and it happens very early. These are the main causes of alcohol abuse in teens. Stress, genetics, personality, free alcohol, peer pressure, access in home, rate of maturity, and increased dependence. Here's another question. How many people binge drink at least three to seven drinks at one time in the United States every month? Binge drinking is another term for getting messed up. Is it A, 65,000, B, 6.5 million, or C, 65 million? The answer is 65 million. By the way, this isn't just people that are 21 and over. Teenagers and underage drinkers are included in this. Binge drinking is a new term they use for getting wasted. Even if people don't drink all the time, the prevalence of binge drinking is on the rise. It means when they do drink, it's a lot. The risk for men is different than for women. Binge drinking risks for men are increased aggression, increased physical assault, increased risk of sexual assault, increased risk of unprotected sex, increased risk of committing suicide, increased risk of multiple sexual partners, increased risk of sexually transmitted diseases. You might wonder why men are more at risk of violent attack. It's because men are the most susceptible to demonic possession. For one reason only, they have two minds. One mind is in their head, the other mind is in their pants. This is not anything you haven't heard before. Nobody knows why though, I do. It's because their sperm have their own consciousness. There is something alive in a man's testicles, a billion different entities with their own agenda. This is to make it to this plane of existence by any means necessary. When he's sober, he might be able to control himself, but under the influence, they take over the wheel and his body is doing their will. If his testicles are infected with demonic possession, you have a billion tiny demons controlling this big giant. It's a scary thing because he becomes a predator. Women, on the other hand, become prey. These are the risks to women who binge drink. Mood disorders, leads to infertility, interrupts the menstrual cycle, increased risk of sexual assault, more likely to have unprotected sex, increased risk of unwanted pregnancy, leads to yeast infections, candida, increased risk of sexually transmitted diseases, increased risk of fetal alcohol syndrome, increased risk of mental and physical birth defects. Women are already at risk for assault, but if she's inebriated, she can't fight back or remember enough details to give a statement to the police. In the court system, the jury doesn't have much compassion for a drunk victim. It's not right, but it's a fact. Even if she was roofied, they say she has no business there. Women need to take that into account when they visit these establishments and hang around a bunch of drunk men. It's dangerous. You only need one demon to turn that party into a crime scene. Drunk shopping yields retailers $48 billion annually. All drunk shoppers will spend $500 billion in their lifetime while drunk. People are shopping on their phones, at home alone, even impulse buying from TV or catalogs. A drunk person isn't going to go into a mall, but if a club is in a place like South Beach where stores are open until 5 a.m., any drunk person can go in and spend money. 
Many people go to restaurants after partying all night. They will eat more to soak up the alcohol. So many fast food drive through windows make a fortune from the hours of 12 midnight until 6 a.m. People are drunk looking for sugar, carbs, fat, dairy, and meat. Something is driving them to it. Let's talk about what's driving them to it. There are three primary causes of alcohol addiction. Low oxytocin, low serotonin, and low dopamine. Let's talk about what we need the most. The pyramid is based on needs. The greatest needs are at the bottom. Number one is low oxytocin. Oxytocin is the chemical a person gets when they feel loved, cared for, nurtured, and accepted. It's already in the body, but it's triggered by being around others. Most scientists believe that people are addicted to social media for the dopamine, but I believe it's the lack of oxytocin that occurs first. They seek dopamine to satisfy the lack of oxytocin. Oxytocin is what little babies get by being in contact with the mother after birth. They feel safe, fed, safe to go to sleep, and they feel loved. Many alcoholics have issues with their mothers. They were rejected early on and they never felt safe. They can get oxytocin from their father also, but if he's an alcoholic, violent or absent, the child really needs mom to pick up the slack. Number two is low serotonin. Serotonin is the well-being hormone. 90% is created in the gut and 10% is created in the brain. A mother that has low serotonin will transfer this to her child. That means if the mother has a hard time staying happy, she will have an unhappy baby. A mother that has candida will transfer the pathogenic yeast to her child in utero. If the child is born by C-section, the mother will not transfer good bacteria to the baby. That means the child's system is compromised at birth. Candida suppresses serotonin. Candida eats sugar, aka alcohol. The vagus nerve is the highway from the gut to the brain. Candida will hijack the brain, triggering the person to crave sugar or alcohol so it can get fed and spread and dopamine will only be released when this happens. Number three is low dopamine. When the dopamine reserves are gone, meaning the alcohol has left the system, the person has low dopamine. This coupled with low oxytocin and low serotonin, the person drinks more to get the dopamine. They are a slave to candida. Drinking initially was caused by low oxytocin, but addiction, the constant need to drink more, is caused by candida. Candida is insatiable. This is why they need to drink more and more. Not because they like it, it's because their system is compromised and the alcohol is now a noose around their neck. Candida is inside their brain, at the wheel, directing them to eat and drink to excess because that's what it likes. In other parts of this documentary, I'm going to show you this is how all addiction occurs. These primary causes are rooted in childhood. They have everything to do with the mother. People that abuse alcohol are not happy people. They have unhealed wounds and they can be traced back to an individual, an event, or a life stage. The enemy triggers these unhealed wounds spiritually and then Candida facilitates the manipulation of the biochemistry to keep the person in bondage. Secondary causes of alcohol addiction are number one, high cortisol, number two, low serotonin, number three, high adrenaline. These secondary causes have more to do with adulthood. These are situations occurring in their life and is causing stress. These stressors could be work-related, family-related, or related to some current mental illness they're battling. Number one is high cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone. It stays in the body longer than adrenaline. It wears a person down over time. Adrenaline is immediate stress. Cortisol is prolonged stress. 
When people are under prolonged stress, they tend to become depressed. They already have low serotonin because cortisol suppresses serotonin. When they feel like they're drowning, they get angry, enraged, anxious, just to pull themselves out of depression. These people are in survival mode. They feel that it's life or death. They drink to survive. Number two is low serotonin. Since they have low serotonin since childhood, which goes back to unhealed wounds, this low serotonin is a precursor to addiction in adulthood. They have candida in their gut, which is why most alcoholics have a beer or alcohol belly. It's the candida being fed and spreading in their gut. Since serotonin is made 90% in their gut, the candida that's taken over and overgrown won't allow serotonin to be produced. This makes them angry and bitter and mean because serotonin is the well-being hormone. It makes a person feel at peace, like all is well. Anger is nothing more than unexpressed sadness. Low serotonin leads to depression and sadness. They develop a panic because the sadness leads to morbid depression, which is what the enemy wants. He wants the alcoholic to drink himself to death, and the person knows that, so they reach for more alcohol to satisfy the beast inside that he doesn't know. Just like you pay the bully so he doesn't beat you up. Number three, this fear leads to high adrenaline. If you ever wanna see a person in a panic, tell them that their favorite drink is out of stock. Their behavior will change so quickly or let their bar be closed down or when they're cut off, you will be dealing with a different being. I've seen it all. The person is drinking because they're in a panic. It might not look like it, but they are avoiding the pain of their depression. Candida makes sure they never are in a state of well-being, so they can always be triggered. They're terrified of not giving this being what it wants. By the way, alcoholics see the world in black and white. It's either life or death. They drink to live. If they don't get a drink, they will have to face their pain. And for them, that's as close to death as they've ever come. These are the biochemical explanations for alcohol addiction. The main causes of alcohol abuse in adults is stress, family history, they drank at an early age, medicine codependence, or mental health problems like depression. I want to read you a few excerpts from my book, God's Pharmacy, Eve's Serpent Candida. In it, I go into meticulous detail about how candida is the cause of 95% of all diseases. You can get it on Amazon now. You could easily spend six months reading it. You will probably know more than any doctor you've ever been to. Candida is a corporation. It has enterprises all over the world that cater to its growth. One of these industries is the alcohol industry. Alcohol contains yeast and sugar. Beer especially has yeast and sugar. Alcohol spirits contain mostly sugar. The alcohol works because the candida inside their bodies is activated through the introduction of massive amounts of sugar. The alcohol gives candida the keys to your mind. Candida starved has no power. Have you ever seen a nice sweet person turn into a violent drunk? What happened to their original personality? Beer, for instance, has about 10 to 12 grams of carbohydrates per bottle. When the alcohol enters the stomach, 20% of it reaches the bloodstream right away. Alcohol immediately weakens your immune system. Candida takes that opportunity to grow as it feasts on the carbohydrates in your bloodstream. 80% of the alcohol makes it to the small intestines. From there, it goes into the bloodstream and into the liver. Alcohol has a carcinogenic effect on the body. It means that the body interprets it as a toxin. These are just some of the effects alcohol has on the human body. It blocks vitamin absorption, blocks blood to muscles and organs, suppresses the immune system, causes irregular heartbeat, releases dopamine in the brain, affects memory and motor skills, clots the blood, blocks oxygen in tissues, inflames the liver, causing cirrhosis, pancreas hemorrhage,
diabetes, jaundice, mental health problems, depression. Oh, there's more. Swells the bladder, frequent urination, diuretic, traps bile in the gallbladder, can cause coma, death, blood poisoning, increases risk of stroke and heart attack, inflames the lining of the stomach, can cause ulcers, burns the mouth, throat, and esophagus, hijacks the brain's neurotransmitters, change in mood, behavior, cognition, creates addiction and chemical dependence. There is really no benefit to drinking alcohol that would outweigh its negative effects. All addiction follows a cycle. Number one, a trigger, which could be anything, an event, a memory, a pain, this triggers a current thought, such as, I'm not good enough, my mother doesn't love me, I'm ugly, I'm never going to make enough money. It really doesn't matter because whatever the thought is, it's a lie because it comes from Satan. This thought triggers an emotion, such as, I'm hurting, I'm lonely, I'm sad, I'm depressed, I'm bored. This emotion sits on the person, depending on how much capacity they have for frustration, they will act on this emotion to get rid of it. The emotion triggers a behavior. The behavior is to get rid of the emotion. It's to put the person in another state. They are uncomfortable. This behavior can be get a drink, go shop, go gamble, go sleep with someone. All addiction is the same. The enemy knows what he signed you up for, so he's going to trigger the emotion that will produce the desired behavior. The behavior always comes with consequences. These consequences could be a hangover, memory loss, a headache, vomiting, waking up in someone's bed, spending too much money, having to apologize for what you did the night before, and of course, an addiction. When this karma wheel turns around, the person will get triggered again and the cycle continues. There's a fine line between a social drinker and an alcoholic. A social drinker drinks whenever they have a drink in front of them. An alcoholic always has a drink in front of them. The alcoholic cannot face life without a drink. They go around this addiction wheel every single day. They don't want to face any type of emotion or feel anything. They are sprinting from the pain. This is the devil's finest work. If he can get the person to spin around so fast they don't even see the pattern, he can usher them into the hell of addiction which is hell on earth. In Matthew 26, 41, King James Version, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Alcohol makes a man weak. He can't think, can't make rational decisions, can't control his impulses, the temptation begins when he accepts the invitation to the bar. The temptation begins when he drives to the club. It begins when he opens the refrigerator and takes out a bottle. No, it begins when he bought it from the convenience store. The enemy has a plan. Stress you out so you want to check out a reality and let him take over. There is hope. 20 million people right now are in recovery from alcohol. 70% of people seeking substance abuse treatment abuse alcohol. When a person receives treatment for alcohol, they need to detox first, which means to dry out, to get the alcohol out of their system. But for people totally dependent, this could be dangerous. When alcohol gets into the system, it starts to rewire how a person's brain functions. There's a condition called delirium tremens. It causes the hands to shake if alcohol isn't in the system. Many CEOs of companies carry a flask in their shirt pocket or desk as well as a bottle of Listerine just to go to meetings. It calms their nerves. When they go to rehab, they won't have that. When they go to jail for public drunkenness, they won't have that. Watching an alcoholic crave beer or wine or alcohol just to satisfy their demons is a frightening sight. If you ever watch that show Intervention, you'll see some behavior similar to an exorcism when they can't get to it. 
A professional can help someone endure this phase of walking out of hell. When you think of rehab, you probably think of something like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, where people are drooling at the mouth, walking around like zombies. It's not like that. They have some nice facilities, some even by the water. It looks more like a vacation destination. It's designed to make a person feel comfortable and stress-free. Stress is the reason they're drinking anyway. There are counselors, activities, chefs, even massage spas, and most of all, there are other people that are suffering from the same thing. The worst thing for an alcoholic is isolation. They feel they are going through it all alone. Sometimes they like being alone so they aren't judged. They know they have a problem, they just don't know how to fix it. Or they're afraid if they take the band-aid of alcohol off of their wound, they'll be too weak to face it. Alcohol is a crutch and it helps the person avoid pain. In counseling, the person would have to face their deepest pain. They would have to go deep down into it, all the way back to childhood up to present day. They aren't doing it alone. They have dedicated counselors that will help them navigate the dark forest of their minds and to face the monster together. The most difficult part is making the decision to go. In a cloud of illusion, the person thinks they have it under control, even though their life is falling apart around them. The enemy blindfolds them and keeps them in bondage. Once they make it through the doors, they have all the help they need to start the process. It's not one size fits all either. A person would really have to take the process seriously, reveal their deepest pain, walk through it so it can't be used by demonic forces when they get out. Some people stay for 21 days, 28 days, three months, six months, and even a year. Some people have a lot of pain. The worst thing to do is to enter rehab with an ego. The counselors would have to chop down the ego before they could get to the root of the problem. The ego is Satan. He will try his best to contaminate the process by hindering the person from delving into their deepest, darkest secrets. I think rehab facilities that have a mindfulness, spiritual component are the best because they give tools that the person can use for life. Meditation is the greatest way to heal from any addiction. I saw a documentary about Eric Clapton. He used to have a serious substance abuse problem. He was using everything. He got cleaned up and opened a treatment facility in Antigua, an island in the Caribbean. I'm not recommending any place because I personally have never been, but it looks like a top of the line facility. And if you need to get away from everything and everyone that plagues you, it is definitely a place I would consider. Do you have an alcohol abuse problem? Answer this questionnaire called CAGE which stands for the keywords in the four questions. Add plus one for each yes. Number one, have you ever felt you needed to cut down on your drink? Number two, have people annoyed you by criticizing your drink? Number three, have you ever felt guilty about drinking? Number four, have you ever felt you needed a drink first thing in the morning, an eye opener to steady your nerves or to get rid of a hangover? A score of two or higher indicates excessive drinking and abuse. If you wanna heal from alcohol addiction, here are some tips that work. Number one, change your friends especially the ones that drink number two change your entertainment environment music and media number three stop drinking and other addictive behaviors like drugs number four pray for spiritual help with sincerity from god Number five, seek professional assistance in a rehab facility or a hospital. Number six, seek a clinical therapist or life coach or clergy. Number seven, 
meditation daily, minimum 30 minutes to soft ambient music, not beat driven music. Number eight, cleanse and detox your body with a candida diet. Number nine, journal daily about your thoughts, your emotions, and see if you can recognize your triggers. Number 10, retrace your family origins of addiction or ask about some of your family's secrets. Some of this stuff comes through the DNA, whether you know it or not. I myself walked up to the door of alcoholism 15 years ago. I found myself drinking vodka and cranberry for breakfast. It was only day two when I went to do it again that God stopped my hand in midair. He showed me what I was doing. I poured the vodka down the drain and backed away from the counter. He showed me in a vision that I was inches away from alcoholism. I thank him every day because I just couldn't see it. I continued drinking for years, but only at night. Today, I don't drink at all, and he is a deliverer. You can call the Alcohol Abuse Hotline 24 hours a day at 888-633-3239. You can speak confidently to an advisor who can help you find out if you have a problem and how to get help. Sometimes you just need someone to talk to. Please call, even if you know someone that needs help. You might be the only thing standing between them and the grave. I have two books that will give you the cheat codes to end addiction. They are both on Amazon. They are part of a series I call God's Pharmacy. That's my way of thanking God for healing me from drug and alcohol addiction. If I can help others, then he didn't waste his time saving my life. He didn't have to choose me. I saw hell. I saw my death and he rescued me and he can do it for you. You can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and join me on Facebook. Stay tuned for part two of this addiction documentary where we cover drugs. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And thank you for watching. God bless you.